All right, I'm very pleased this morning to have um, Lieutenant Tony Ballinger uh, on Fighting Men of Rhodesia. And um, Tony has some interesting um, stories to tell. And so, Tony, without further ado, I'm going to hand over to you. Thank you very much for your time. Um, tell us a little bit about your, about your background and then how you got into the Army. <laughs> John, thanks very much for giving me the opportunity to talk. Um, I'd just like the audience to know that I asked you to talk, so uh, not because of anything I achieved, <laughs> far from it, when I've heard what other guys have done, but some um, presentation to national servicemen that didn't go on into special forces and the RLI. Um, basically, when I left school in 1972 from Churchill, um, I worked for a year in order to save up money to travel overseas on a holiday. And I worked for Standard Bank in um, Cecil Square and then Internal Affairs in Plumtree, which was a, a fantastic place. I had so much fun there, hunting and fishing and so on. But um, I, at that time, I represented Mashonaland and underwater hockey, uh, a strange game that actually made its way into the Olympics. and. Uh, when we went down to Bloemfontein for the interprovincial games with the South Africans, um, that uh, journey took me halfway to Cape Town where I caught a ship um, overseas. And I did all sorts of things in England from a carpentry assistance job to a lifeguard or whatever. And that gave me enough money to get over to Australia where I became an assistant train driver. Um, um, I met a lovely blonde girl there who traveled further with me, an American girl. And we went through all Bali, Malaysia, Thailand, back to England, caught a ship back to South Africa, and then flew back to Salisbury together. Um, when we got back to Salisbury, I was a long haired hippie with a beard and beads and with the mental attitude of uh, Billy Connolly. Uh, I found life a bit of a joke. <laughs> And uh, it was lovely to be home after two and a half, three years. But uh, Jess got a real hard time at immigration from the, the immigration officer and said, you haven't got a visa or proof of support. You've got six weeks to find a job or else we're deporting you. Anyway, we went to stay with my mom and dad. And my mom wasn't the easiest person. She's just about destroyed every relationship I've ever had. And um, so about three weeks into being back in Rhodesia, um, I got my call-up papers, which was just such a shock to the system. I mean, my girlfriend hadn't found a job. We were living at home, and now I was going to go off to the army. Um, when I showed Jess the call-up papers, she was so distressed <coughs> that she phoned her dad in America, who's a wealthy financier, and he said, well, I'll sponsor you guys to come to the States, and I'll give you a car to drive around America, which was a Corvette Stingray. <laughs> and some spending money uh, and in my left hand I had my quarter papers and in my right hand an offer like that but for many different and, different and complex reasons I chose to go on my national service which totally destroyed our relationship in the end and it was sad because we were going to get married that's how far it had gone anyway um, I went off down to Heaney on the troop train one night Heaney Junction I think it is outside Bulaway and uh, there I got off the train feeling really depressed. It was gooty. Um, and the first thing I saw was MP shouting at us. And I thought this is bad news. Anyway, the tube train landed at about half past seven, but the trucks only came to get us at half past eight, which is an indication of the frustration of the army. You know, hurry up and wait. We were all wet and miserable. Anyway, um, I put on a bit of weight after being, and um, I, my introduction to army life was not very really, uh, encouraging with my mental state at the time. And, um, you know, we were shark shit and all that sort of stuff. You know, you know what it's like. Off to the barber, hair off, be beads off, beard off. Oh, I couldn't <laughs> believe how young I looked. <laughs> uh, and then some sadistic bugger made us go and get our, um, injections three in one which hurt like colors you know and then we had to go into a hangar and it was combat jeans long and shirt long thrown at us my brother warned me get good sized boots you know because if you don't you're going to suffer anyway 
that started the runs in the morning. I was unfit. I suffered really badly from asthma as a kid. So I really struggled to begin with. And and um, the only thing I remember of the corporals there was was their tonsils, because their mouths were always okay. open, shouting at us. Anyway, on about day two, we were taken into the the, um, the auditorium and we met Colonel Rowley, the camp commandant, and um, he told us that um, any guy who didn't have O level and above must exit door left. And about 25 got, guys got up and left. And he said the rest of you. So I thought, oh, that's nice. At least I might get some rank and it wouldn't be so bad. So we started out about 100 or 125 of us on a two day selection course for Osbys. And um, the, the first day was very much a mental test, uh, testing your mental, uh, the ability to talk clearly and reason and, and make plans and that type of thing. Um, and at the end of that first day, I think about 60 guys had been dropped. And on the second day, we had to do practical obstacles like getting an ammunition case out of a, an enclosed fenced off area with a few ropes and a, and a few poles. And it wasn't so much succeeding in the tasks, but the the officers with their clipboards were looking for guys who were coming up with ideas and giving instructions rather than being a passenger. And so at the end of the second day, there were only 10 of us left and we were shunted off on a train up to Guello, up to Osby's. And the first thing I remember there is being uh, greeted by Sergeant Keith Bartlett from the RLI. And all I saw of Keith for the, the next six weeks was his tonsils because his mouth was always open. And we'd been demoted from Sharkshit in Llewellyn to lower than Sharkshit at the School of Infantry. And we were told what a bunch of wankers we were and we'd never succeed in anything. Anyway, the, the course officer was uh, Theo Williams, ex Sully Scout, Captain Theo Williams. He was badged as an RAR guy when we were there. And um, he did everything in his power to break us physically. And in fact, in intake 149, I was in take 142. The course commandant there said, you know, Theo, back off a bit. You, you're sending too many guys back to Bulawayo through breaking them physically. But I don't think he listened. <laughs> <laughs> on our course, he just, uh, boy, he revved us. So we had to drag car tires on uh, battle marches. We had to uh, go on log runs. We had to march from Saluki with a wet sack of sand in our backpacks and full kits, and that was 30 Ks. And, you know, the worst thing is that we had this 44-gallon drum uh, called Felix that was nicely painted with a face on it. And we had to carry it up to the top of the hill at Guela at the slightest indiscretion. You know, if we couldn't strip our weapons quick enough or we went on parade with a bit of dirt on our stick boots, up, up the hill. Now, the hill's not that high, but it's quite steep in places. And only four of us could carry that drum up there because it was uh, the poles were short and it was in, in like a, a, a cradle. And boy, we were terrified of dropping that thing. But we got so sick of going up there that one day we decided to empty the drum and carry it up empty. And old Theo Williams had gone up there in his Land Rover and he was waiting for us. And he said, right, you miserable swan. I'll teach you a lesson. <laughs> and, and he gave us, he said, take one water bottle and go to the bottom of the hill uh, where Felix's uh, little house was. And um, you fill up one bottle at a time until that drum is full. Well, there were only 10 of us and the 44 gallon drums, 200 liters. So that was 20 trips each up and down that hill. Um, it took most of the day and our fingernails were missing and we were absolutely buggered. I can't remember being more <laughs> in more pain than that. But to cut a long story short, it was a brilliant course. And the learning curve mentally and psychologically for me from being a hippie with Billy Connolly's mentality to having to learn how to be an officer was um, another thing. But, you know, the beauty of the Rhodesian Army is that we had guys who'd been in combat and experienced war and they were now training us. Unlike the German Air Force, they, their top guys never went back to train the beginners. And so their, um, their Air Force never progressed in quality. 
<clears throat> anyway, at the we then started all all the stuff that you that you learn in the army and uh, stripping weapons, handling weapons. Uh, we went to Katanga to learn how to fire mortars and do all sorts of stuff, and call in the air force for attacks, etc. Then our coin training started, which was very good. You know, we learned all about camouflage and the five S's. You know, shit, shine, shape, silhouette, sound, whatever it was. We learned how to, to do tracking, how to attack camps, how to attack the enemy, do flanking positions, all that sort of stuff. It was brilliant. We learned medic stuff, explosives, um, was very thorough. And then at the end of that period, we did our conventional war training, uh, which was superb, um, learning how to do sand models, give orders, um, do the advance, do the withdrawal, do reconnaissance, and the last thing we did was the early morning attack of our entire company um, up against um, some defending forces, one of whom uh, was Ant Marsh, who got the Sword of Honor. He had twisted his ankle very badly, and he said to me afterwards, man, that was scary watching you guys come up the hill. I wouldn't like to, it, it to be for real. Anyway, out of all of that, three guys commissioned, uh, myself, Pete Wells, and Ant Marsh. Ant Marsh went off to artillery. I got four independent company with Pete Wells. He got six platoon, I got four platoon. And we had three sergeants, and uh, the one sergeant was Phil Lang, who very sadly got murdered by uh, Mugabe's thugs after the war, when Tony Blair was uh, giving Mugabe jip. And he was doing an audit in Burma Valley for the tea, tea guys. Guys were agitating at the time, if you might remember, with <clears throat> Tony Blair refusing to pay for farms and that were being taken away. And so they, they tied him to a tree and made him drink pool acid. Ooh. And that was his death. And he was a lovely, he was a personal friend of mine. Anyway, Phil got fifth platoon. <clears throat> and we were posted to Wanky where fifth platoon was, uh, four in depth was operating. And my first introduction to the company was we had to be on parade at nine o'clock in the morning <clears throat> and um, just drink a bit of water. My introduction was being shouted at by the major for not going on with the, with the beret. <laughs> he said, Lieutenant Ballinger, you don't come on parade without a, a beret, get away. <laughs> And all the guys, some of the guys sniggered because, you know, I'd gone to school with them, like Dave Krieger. He had a good snigger. And um, anyway, came back with my beret on, was introduced to the guys. I got about 30 men and we spent the rest of the day getting the equipment and signing for our vehicles. And thank God I was posted to Victoria Falls rather than Wanky. I just didn't... <laughs> stay in that hot, smelly hellhole. Um, so the next morning we drove up to Big Falls. We were based at the police station under the 2RC of uh, Sean of Strance. Um, my major was, I think his name was Martin B. R. A. R. He wasn't Dumpy Pierce or the, the Pierce that got killed in Zambia. Um, dark haired guy with glasses. <clears throat> nice guy. Anyway, we no sooner got to Vic Falls, we were based at the police station. And uh, I was very unhappy that we were deployed the first day we were there. I, I didn't even know my men's names or anything like that. So I had to break them up into sticks, make sure each stick had a radio and an MAT and gave them maps, blah, blah, blah. And we deployed at last light about four kilometers west of Vic Falls. And this is all very new to us. And we walked down towards the river. I'll never forget it. It was a moonlit night and the river was silver shining through the trees. And over on the right was Livingston with its lights on and it looked like a snake, you know. And the lights from Livingston were its eyes. It was quite a stunning, profound sight. Anyway, we commenced patrolling there for about four months up and down the river. It was lovely. But lots of ticks, lots of animals, buffalo, elephant, lion, it was magnificent. So we did cross grain patrols during the day and we ambushed at night. And um, I, I had a, a night sight, a, a big cumbersome thing driven by steam or something. 
it used to squeal if you pointed it at them. Anyway, in ambush, I always started the ambush and then I passed the rifle down. They passed rifles left so that each guy had the scope to look at the river. Nothing ever happened for months. And during that period, well, I'd long broken up with my girlfriend from, from the American one. And I met another girl at Vic Falls on our days off. And so it was a lovely place to be based. You know, on a couple of days off, we would go to the casinos or whatever. But then that idyllic period ended and I was shunted out with my platoon to Jambezi Keep, 45 k's east of uh, Big Falls. Keep, 80 meters by 80 meters, four bunkers, one on each corner. <clears throat> and we started patrolling there. It, it was heavily populated. Um, there were no hills for APs. It, we just did the best we could. We did patrols, we did ambushes. Uh, and the locals were on side, you know, they used to come to us and say that there's a group visited our crawl last night. And that was incredible. And that led to ints that we could follow up on. And then, so we knew they were in the area. And then it really started when a Coca-Cola truck resupply, resupplying the African store um, hit a right front mine. And the driver, sadly for him, was really shredded to pieces. But we picked up lots of cakes and panthers and <coughs> and then um, a, a couple of weeks later to the northwest of the keep, um, some cattle stood on a mine and it blew the cow in half and killed a couple of others. So we tried to do a follow up, but it was impossible. There's just too many footprints. <clears throat> so, but the upside was we had a load of meat and one of the guys on call up was the chef the bride that evening for the guys that were in camp. Um, black boots were based there, and uh, the internal affair guys had 10 African soldiers. And so we cut off a leg for them, and we went back. And I thought, well, I'd been in the keep for nearly four weeks directing operations. I thought I'd drive to take a drum to get some beer for the guys. Um, I didn't realize how far it was. It was 65 k's away and it was outside the operational area. The Matetsi River to the east was the boundary. Anyway, I was a naughty guy, I was a little bit rebellious. I thought, stuff it, I'm going there to get beer for my guys. When I got there, it was just starting to get dark, which was stupid of me, it was um, irresponsible. But we loaded up the beers, had a quick beer there. By the time I'd reached the boundary, which was the Matetsi River, as we were coming down towards the bridge, I could see this flare in the distance. And my heart sank. I knew it was Jan Beasy Keep being revved. And then there were sheets of green tracer flying all over the place and the odd red one. And then lots of flashes, big flashes, and which were mortar rounds landing. And I called them on the radio and they wouldn't answer. So I thought, what the hell do I do now? Do I drive in, into a contact and get killed in a stop group? What do I do? So I just drove slowly towards them and man alive. The bangs and all that sort of stuff going on lasted for ages. Um, I think our headlights uh, put the twos off and they disengaged. And I drove up to the gate and I blew the hoot and nobody would come down and open the gate. And in the end, I said, you're in bunker one, get down and open this gate. And the skinny little guy called Mike Abbott slipped down the hill, opened the gate and in we drove. And he I've never seen a guy run up a sand berm so quickly. <laughs> but as it turned out, as it turned out, they I put a report through to Vic Falls. I said, please bring out some guys tomorrow to help us do follow-up because the rest of my platoon was spread out everywhere. <clears throat> the next morning I did a, a 360 around the keep and the mortar fire was incredibly accurate. Uh, five rounds had landed in the keep and uh, I picked up a total of 52 by 82 millimeter tail fins. And they were accurate because I think somebody paced the distance between their firing points and the keep. You know, it, it was a heavily populated area. And two locals near the gate had uh, been injured. And bless those internal affairs guys, they stood their ground on the parapet wall. They didn't run into the bunkers. And they fired away with their 303s. When the follow-up commenced, um, we found uh, firing points of 50 tours with 
thousands of doggies on the ground. And anyway, I got hold of um, uh, Fat One at Wanky. They sent out two G cars with a medic, and they took the, one of the guard force as uh, internal affairs guards was wounded. And they shut them off back to the other. The other chopper, I think, was G card, had four barrels coming out the window, which I think he called a Dalmatian, isn't it? And he assisted in the follow up, but there were so many cattle and the Majibas, and you know, just lost all their bombshells. But then four days later, the scouts were brought in to the area north of the dirt boundary road. Um, and we'd been chomping around like fly swats for, for two months there. And these guys came in and four days later, that killed four of them. And they brought the bodies into the keep. It's the first time I'd seen a dead turd. And um, one had a big hole in his head and there were chickens in the camp that the African guys would eat the eggs off or kill the chickens. And when I looked down at them, the chickens were all picking at his brains. <laughs> No, one of these ugly sites that, that you encounter in war. And it's all the process of learning and becoming harder watching all this stuff. Anyway, um, that, that, uh, that was uh, what happened there. And then I was particularly concerned about the thick bush. So I went out late one afternoon with four guys and a radio. I was driving the four five. Why I did that, I don't know. It was a bit irresponsible. But it just started to drizzle about 20 minutes before we left. And I was going to go out and burn all the bush down. And, um, <clears throat> you know, we would just lick a match and throw it out the window or out the back. And one out of three matches would catch. And we would just drive for kilometers burning the bush. But I noticed these footprints that had been very recently laid. And um, I thought, gee, this guy's out pretty close to curfew. And that thought never went any further because there was a massive red orange flash to my left. I'd hit a landmine and the window wobbled in and there was dust and oil and water. You know, we had water in our tires so that came down in like a mist. And then I looked out the window and there was all this tracer and I thought, oh dear God, I'm not going to see 21, you know. And um Anyway, fortunately, it was red tracer, and it soon. Now, our training was really good at Osby, so I, I jumped up through the the cupola, or whatever you call it, the the hole in the roof, and I shouted to the guys, "Get off the back of the truck in our tire tracks," because we were taught if you jump over the side, you might land on anti-personnel mines, you know. So we all scrambled off the back, ran back 20 or 30 meters, and went to all round fence. The guys on the keep had heard the bang, so they sent out a truck to rescue us. And I'll never forget um, going into the washroom there and looking at my face. And uh, I, and I had the white eyes. My hair was standing on end. You know, it's like a minstrel, one of those minstrel guys that play music, <laughs> the old sambos. Anyway, um, for, unfortunately, when, when the keep was revved, one thing I forgot to tell you is that a mortar round landed right outside the kitchen window and blew the glass in and covered our meat. So we never had a bra anyway. Um, but I let the guys have a couple of beers that night. Then the last thing I want to tell you of that side of, of my experience was we had a very successful cordon and search to the west of the keep was the Kavira forest, which I hated patrolling in because these ruddy great big spider webs would come onto my face because I always led the patrols, you know, and these spiders would scuttle off a face. Oh, gee, I hated that. But there were about five living at the compound there that served the um, uh, the mill that cut the hardwood. And the hardwood was cut in a very, um, you know, good way if, if they didn't just flatten the whole forest. And we always knew that that place was a hotbed of problems for us. It was like a thorn in our belly. So um, Major Pierce one day said, go and do a cordon search there. He sent out an extra platoon. And um, I did a drive-in during the afternoon to check the odometer readings on the truck. And then I went back and we did rehearsals, the two platoons getting on and off the trucks so that each guy knew his position. And then I drove 
uh, until three k short of the, the odometer reading I'd had in the day. Uh, we debussed, and it was white sand. And as I walked, it looked like an arrow going into this blackness, you know, the white sand going off like that. Very powdery sand. In, anyway, I'd looked at the size of the keep on the map, which is quite accurate, the position, the two platoons of guys around the keep, and then police and a couple of armored cars and another two sticks from Big Falls came to do the actual searching. And um, as it transpired, we we found four people of interest there, uh, two, of whom, two of whom were confirmed as tours. So it, it was a so, slow process of, of getting them there. And, you know, I heard some of your special forces guys talking of killing 70 and 60 and, and making comments like that, like it was drinking cups of tea. And we were, we were struggling to pick up one or two people. Okay, Tony, let's talk, uh, let's talk about the attack on Peter's Motel at Vic Falls and, and what sort of happened there. I know you, you were involved or you were yeah, that, a witness that to that. Was, this was a, I think this is a very interesting story. Um, we were at <coughs> Gambese Creek when Peter's Motel was attacked and it was before the wall was built around it, so it was quite a, quite a serious attack. Um, eight tours uh, fired across the Big Falls Bulaway Road into the motel. Uh, two RPG-7s were fired, and a guy called uh, Rob Calvert was killed by one of the RPG-7s. And um, they walked up to the, the motel and fired through the windows. People ran out to get their car. One guy was in a panic and drove into a tree. Um, but the reason I want to tell you the story as it unfolds, it's really interesting. Um, when I got back to Vic Falls a couple of weeks later after the attack, we were called by Special Branch and CID to go to Peter's Motel and walk through the attack with the tour that had actually led the attack. Now, um, I met this guy. He was frightening to look at. I mean, his eyes were sort of really yellow and had thick matted hair. When I looked at his feet, I thought, I know this guy many times with a foot that size. And it turned out to be one of the most notorious terrorists of the entire bush war, was Albert, Albert Nobby. Now, this is quite an interesting story that I'm going to tell you because um, he'd been brought up there to walk through the attack because a person had been killed and they had to make an official report for it. But I just want to read the list of the atrocities that this guy committed. Um, he killed a farmer called Cummings in, in the Vic Falls area. Um, and he delighted in killing him because I've re read his section commander's report. Um, and uh, his section commander was called Watson Cheaper. Um, he, his, house, his wife managed to run out the door. She was pregnant. She went and hidden some cannons in the garden. It was at night. So she escaped. And I don't think they were after her anyway. They wanted to kill Cummings. So they, he had killed Rob Culvert at Peter's Motel. He had killed uh, Cummings. Uh, then he was guilty of placing mines on the Matetsi River Bridge, which derailed the train. He robbed several stores. Um, he was killed hotly. He killed three Catholic missionaries. I think they were German. He killed the bishop, a priest, and a nun from Sacred Heart Mission, where he had been educated. And he, he attacked their car. Well, he put a branch across the road, and when they got out the car to move the branch, and he was all on his own when he did this, he... He was recognized by the priest. They said, oh, Albert, how are you? And his section commander later commented on how, how well they treated him, but he shot them in cold blood. He was, he was a really nasty guy. Um, then he was guilty of the murder of Lance and Austin Nyati, uh, 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 the black soldier. He was guilty of many store robberies in the Bulaway area. Bear Gardens and the attempted murder of Antonio Camacho. 
So this was a nasty, probably one of the worst. I don't know if they were worse than that. But here he was walking through this attack with us. And um, anyway, at the end of the day, when the report had been written, I went back to base. And this is where the story gets very interesting. The next morning at half past seven, um, I was called to the office very hurriedly by um, Major Pierce. And he said, Albert Nwibi has escaped from Vic Falls prison. Now, this has become a very convoluted story because this man was um, a prize for the Rhodesians in terms of propaganda, telling the West how evil these, and to try and get political capital out of it. So he was a hot potato. <clears throat> now, according to the reports that I've, I've read from um, the, the African CID guy that accompanied Albert everywhere, as well as Albert's section commander, <clears throat> when he was caught in Bulaway at a bear hall, um, and well, actually arrested at home from the leads given at the bear hall. Um, he was taken into an office with four um, special, and I think he was made the million dollar offer. You join us or you get hung right now, we're gonna hang you. And they showed him photographs of his mother and stepfather and said, if you go back to committing atrocities like you've been doing, we, we're gonna kill them. I don't think they ever would have, of course, but he took that threat seriously. Anyway, it was now at Vic Falls. He had now escaped at seven o'clock in the morning. This guy, Masuku, who was the CID guy, had gone in to give him breakfast. And uh, he'd got out of his leg iron somehow, and he, he smashed Masuku in the face on the door. And he ran out the door. He was naked except for being in underpants. And he headed straight towards the suburbs of Big Falls. Um, if he had gone southeast into the African compound, he would have been contained there. But if we, if he'd gone further towards Vic Falls Airport, he would have been into the TTL and we would have lost him. So we got information that he'd gone through the um, low-density low suburbs. He, he scared the heck out of a woman who was watering her, her pot plants and drank some water from her hose pipe and then he pushed off. Now, if something fascinating that he was the crossing point to get back to Zambia was just um, at the corner of an island called Chundu, Chundu Island on Vic Falls River, about 15 k's west of Vic Falls. And I don't know how many times I'd ambushed the end of that river. And, you know, anyway, that was where he was supposed to escape. But according to his section commander, he was in Zambia at a place called Sionga or Songo or something like that. They got a call from the, the Zambian army at Kazangula that he was there. And then he was picked up and taken to his commander at that place that began with S. And then they accused him of being a sellout uh, because nobody could break out of jail. And he said, no, no, I'll demonstrate to you how I did it. So they took him to Westland's farm outside Lusaka or FC camp or something like that. And they said, okay, they took him to a scrapyard, they put handcuffs on him. They said, there's lots of metal around here, show us how, do you, how you get out of handcuffs. And he couldn't come underground in prison for the rest of the war. But at the end of the war, <clears throat> he was released and he returned to his old ways. And he was responsible for killing uh, Gloria Olds in Zimbabwe. And I think by extension, he must have known Martin Owls and probably had something to do with him being killed. But anyway, my two sticks were tasked to go along the Kazangula Road to try and keep him north of that road. If he had turned south, he would have got into the, was the national parks uh, bordered by the Zambezi River at the top. And so choppers came in, the major got in a pro plane, uh, other troops were brought in for the follow up in that area. and, and there were lots of roads and cut lines where you could have done cross grain patrols and stuff. So if we'd contained them there, we would have had a good chance of catching him. We actually did uh, catch another two. He might have been a liaison guy, I don't know. But the whole thing was very suspicious. That guy did not break out of jail. And uh, we pretty convinced, um, in fact, Musuku is the CID guy, that he was uh, let out uh, by the Rhodesians uh, security forces. 
because he got to Kazangula quicker than blinking an eye. And um, anyway, we we patrolled along that road. The tactics I used was uh, I estimated how far he could have run in a half an hour. It was very soft sand. I didn't know he was further north because he went in through the the suburbs uh, of, of the village, which was closer to the river, and we were up on the escarpment where the road was. But I put down four guys with the radio. I then drive another 500 meters, and I said, you guys, live. if you see him, open fire on him and commence your follow-ups. And then we leapfrog the whole day, going west the whole day, till about three in the afternoon. By that time, we were about uh, 40 k's west of Big Falls, and a hell of a rainstorm came down, and the major phone called us from flying in the plane, the police plane, and said, break off the follow-up. And he said, um, Tony, I want you to go to Kazangila there for further orders. So this huge rainstorm had made us wet, and we arrived at this police camp, which was a lovely colonial police camp, as Don Price attested to in his fourth talk whitewashed buildings with asbestos roofs for the African quarters. And there was a lovely pub there and quarters for the European staff. And then a beautiful view down onto the river where the, the police speedboats were. And anyway, we went into the pub. I said to the guys, you've worked hard. <clears throat> about 10 o'clock that night, about 10 o'clock that night, I was naked. And I was put in this room with lovely white sheets. I had a shower, went to bed naked. <laughs> Woke up the next morning with the best coffee I've ever had. And about eight o'clock, I went outside and I, the guys were drying their clothes off in the sun. And I said, listen, um, do a weapons check, you know, clean your weapons and make sure your magazines aren't all gummed up from the, the dust and the rain. And I got a call at the member in charge's office to, from Paul's. And he said, I'm coming out. I'll be there in about an hour and a half. And this is where I'd met the uh, member in charge of Kazangula Police Camp that Don Price attested to as well. His name was Kemp, and uh, he had gone bush or he'd had too much sun or whatever, but he was quite an er erratic character, as, as you'll see in the unfolding story. Um, anyway, about an hour and a half later, um, the, the armored cars arrived with uh, Major Price, uh, two, three, and he said, I want your two fives because you know, you can drive in sandy areas better than a 4.5. So we swapped vehicles. On the back of the 4.5 was a two-inch mortar, two boxes of ammo, and three boxes of ball ammo. And um, he said, I want you to show the flag down the Botswana border. So there we were, the fourth American armored division of, of, of an eland and a ferret, and a 4.5. And I thought, oh, this is a James Sealer's job. And so we we were going down the border towards Panamatinga, which is about 100 k's away. And he said, go halfway, look for spore, see if the fence is cut, just give us a general report. Let people see you so that they know the Rhodesian army's there. <clears throat> and I thought, oh, lovely job. But before I left, I thought, well, I'll, I'll, we drove west to the Rhodesian customs post which was about 100 meters from the border. And I thought, I thought, let's have a look at the river before we go. We can start our flag waving exercise from there. We could see Botswana soldiers just 100 meters from us, and they gave us two zips, and we gave them two zips. And, uh, anyway, we drove north right up to the river, and there was a fairly substantial bunker there that could easily have withstood an RPG-7, and it could have good top cover, timber with sandbags, and the armed car parked behind that, my truck parked. There it parked about 20 meters away on the western side of a bush, which will become very important as the story unfolds. And we got off the vehicles and went into the, off the vehicle and went into the bunker, uh, got out my binos, and I quickly established that there was a large uh, Zambian army bunk on the other side with guys looking at us through the slits. One guy had a pair of binos and I waved at him and he waved at me. And then about four of them climbed on top of the bunker and it's 400 meters wide there. I, I checked the distance before I came onto this talk. And the air was dense because it was cool and we could hear each other quite clearly. 
And so they started to insult us and we started to insult them and we gave them a few brown noses. And then they started to insult uh, Smithy, which I didn't like because uh, my mom knew Janet Smith. She was on a couple of committees with her. And I'd met Ian Smith when I was about 15 and I, I just found him to be so taken aback when they started deriding him. Anyway, I thought this was going nowhere and we got down from the bunker and was about to clear off when all of a sudden all hell let loose. I mean, what they threw at us was unbelievable. There were machine guns, there were AKs, there were mortars, there were RPG-7s and a 12.7. It just, it, you know, and I pulled the guys down into the bunker. I said, set your sights to 400 meters. U-4 gunner were aimed at a trench, which was just to the right or east of their bunker. Now, if you look on a map today, you'll think I'm talking rubbish because a large re-entrance is actually formed where the bunker was. 45 years ago, the riverbank was solid. Now it's got a large re-entrance under the new bridge they built. But anyway, the, the firing commenced and I thought, ah, at last, I'm losing my virginity of being a soldier. You know, and we pumped it into them and that was lovely watching that brown squirting the other side. Really, he, he zeroed in very quickly. I'll never forget the guy had a big hook nose and he was grinning away as this thing was firing. Um, anyway, it got quite hairy, you know, with the 12.7. An RPG-7 took off the, the top of the tree where the ferret was parked and old hook nose only just got into the thing before it landed on top of him. And then, you know, I thought, you know, they got to try and suppress enemy fire. So I'd emptied all my magazines and we had the boxes of ammo on the back of the truck and we'd broken them open. We were recharging our magazines and firing away. It went on for about 45 minutes to an hour. And I thought, no, we've got to get out of here before somebody gets injured. So I ran out the back with a guy called Abbott and we jumped into an old mortar pit that was already there with sandbags around the perimeter. And the only injury of that whole uh, contact when I, I knocked off um, uh, a, a nest of hornets, big black things, and this thing came up and stung me right in my top lip. And it, it's the most painful thing I've ever felt in my life. Anyway, my eyes were watering. My lip was swelling up, so I was talking with the lift. They get get the mortar out of there, you know. <laughs> and we positioned the mortar, and I lined it up to the left of the bunker and um, put one charge on it. It was a two-inch thing with a handle at the bottom. And I lined it up, and I fired the first round. Now, they'd anchored the ferry about 60 meters from the Zambian shoreline. I don't know why they'd done that. But the first round landed in the water, actually detonated, believe it or not, and was just between the ferry and that trench. And I thought, oh, not bad. I depressed the elevation a bit and put three or four rounds. One of them looked like it actually went into the trench. I was quite proud of myself. But all the while, these other things were being fired at us and mortars landing everywhere. It was really hairy. Um, and then I swung it left to try. And I'd noticed behind the bunker, there was some army vehicles under a, um, a tree. So I depressed the elevation a bit more and put four or five rounds into the vehicles. And then our main threat was that 12.7, which was firing from about four to 500 meters downstream. And so I put an entire case of ammo on, on that thing and they were accurate. And I'm pretty sure that's where the mortar pit was because the mortaring stopped the RPG-7 stopped and the 12.7 stopped. But then, and then um, it, it calmed down a little bit and um, then it started up again. And I said to this guy, Dave, in the Elan through his hatch, I said, Dave, you've got to help, help us sort the buggers out, you know, on the other side. So he radioed Wanky. He had to get permission to fire across the river, which was given to him straight away because they could, when he depressed the toggle, he, the guy and the jock there could hear all the bangs and machine guns firing. And um, so anyway, when this armored car came around the bunker, there was a distinct dip in the aggression from the other side. The first round that was fired went over the bunker 
the second round he depressed the, the gun a little bit and the second round a heat round high explosive anti-tank went into the bunker and there was just all this dust and, and humors coming out the slits and we were cheering away and then he put three more rounds in there and then he put another two rounds into the trench which soldiers were in and then he swung it right and put two or three rounds onto the 12.7. Um, there was a secondary explosion when he fired at the points. The grass uh, caught on fire. The, the grass bank was surprisingly well grassed for Zambia. And we, there was an easterly wind blowing, in other words, heading west. And so this huge firestorm rolled along the whole waterfront and probably burnt out their vehicles because, you know. And anyway, um, then everything quietened down. I think that really put a, a thorn in the flesh. And in the afternoon, we saw guys on stretchers being carted away. And one cheeky sod stuck his head around the corner of the immigration post. And I thought, well, I got my marksmanship badge at uh, Osby's and I set my sights and offset for the wind and I plugged them. So that was his fault for being stupid. Um, anyway, late afternoon when the sun was setting, we, it was now dark enough for us. Uh, I said to the guys, walk back 200 meters and wait for me. I said to the armored car guys, I don't want them to know we're leaving. So drive out with the lowest revs possible and don't use your brake pedals. I don't want them to see the brake lights. So they drove out. Then that left the four or five, and I said to the driver, I'm going to drive it out, which he objected to. So I said, RHIP, get out of here. Um, and I didn't want any of the guys to hurt you, see. And then I thought, the way the truck was positioned, I would have had to reverse it towards the river, put my foot on the brake, and they would have seen me. And I had a brainwave. The cardboard boxes that the bullets had come out of were the same size as the brake light. So I squashed them. When I put my foot on the brake, they couldn't see anything and kept the lights off and drove out the back. And then we went back to the, the police camp and it was high fives. And I said to the guys, you know, we were no longer virgins with, with fired our weapons. I said, go and get pissed. I don't care. The police camp was guarded by the police. I said, go and have a good time. Around about 10 o'clock, there were massive explosions to the west. And uh, this guy called Kemp, the police member in charge, uh, he said, come with me. And I said, well, what are you talking about? But anyway, I followed him, a uh, red and white painted communication tower, which is probably 40, 50 foot high, that Don Price had alluded to. He had gone up it as well. And just like him, I don't like heights, but Kemp flew up this thing. He was wild. I stayed on the lower platform, but I could see the explosions back at the at the um, bunker that we'd abandoned. And I just laughed and I thought, yeah, you're wasting all that ammo for nothing. And they blew the heck out of that place. So I said, what have you got in mind? He said, they've got the army base right on the banks of the river there. And they've got these nice windows we can shoot. So we got in his boat with an MAG and a couple of guys and we sailed west on, his, on the boat, beautifully smooth water. And we got up opposite the army camp and we emptied three belts on the MAG into the base and we fired our, our bullets off and our magazines. You know, look, you know, the professional guys watching this must think I'm a bit of a tosser for doing that, but we were young, basically. So that was the end of that. And then I was sent back to patrolling west of Big Falls. And I want to share another incident with you now, um, about 15 k's west of Big Falls. I went down late one evening to um, get water. Well, it was late afternoon when I thought our camouflage uh, was adequate enough to go down to the water's edge and fill up our bottles. But we must have been seen from the Zambia PG7 came over and hit a tree behind us. And you know, I, I focused on the other side to see where the tracer was coming from. And I told my guys to open fire, return fire. Then I'd noticed, and this was 
really scary actually because I noticed this silver airplane doing circles over Livingston and I got my binos out and focused on it. Now the rays of the sun could still reach the plane. Where we were, it was quite dark. And one of our traces had set and, and there's this uh, pillar of flames now. And I don't know if those Zambian guys were in contact with that aircraft, but it stopped doing right wing circles uh, clockwise. And it was about 2,500 feet high. And it actually came for us. There was no doubt in my mind that was an attack flight path, the, the way he came in. And I'd seen rockets under the wings. Um, it, it's an aircraft called an MB-320 Mackey, and it's exactly the same aircraft the South Africans call the Impala. And the fuel tanks were bright orange, and the tail plane was bright orange. So it was actually a, a training plane, and I've confirmed this by going onto Google that the Zambian Air Force had about 30 of these planes delivered to them. The ones that were left silver were the training aircraft. But anyway, he came for me, and I said to the guys, get back. Uh, there was a drive a tributary behind us I said, get in there. And we got in there, and this thing came and came and came until it was getting quite big. And we were still being fired at, and then it banked right and west, about 500 meters from the river. And we could hear the jet engines, and there were the rockets under the wings. And I tell you, I was crapping myself. I really sympathize with any terrorist that ever faced a hunter, because that day I knew, I knew what, what, uh, <laughs> anyway. We leopard crawled out of there and ran east to get away from the whole scene. And that was the end of that. Um, now, the, the second to last story I want to give you is um, towards the end of my... Uh, before I go any further, that attack at Kazangula, I think it provoked the Zambian army and Zipra into really hitting Don Price's guys in October of that year, 1977 when one in depth had taken over from four in depth. And um, they, they knocked the hell out of Don Price's guys and the, um, the police station was virtually flattened. And I think a little bit of it was payback from my scene, I've got a feeling. Anyway, three months before the end of my national service, um, we were transferred to uh, one in depth at Binga under Don Price. I didn't want to leave Vic Falls because I had my girlfriend in the casinos and golf courses and swimming pools. And um, I was slightly in awe of Don Price. Uh, he is a, a consummate officer, one of the founding members of the Lee Scouts. And I'd always suffered a little bit from lack of self-confidence, which was actually brought out to me on my Osby's course. They said, you've got to harden up a bit or else you're gonna, you won't pass the course. But um, Anyway, I was a little bit nervous of going to um, operate under uh, Don. I wasn't quite sure whether I'd live up to his standards. But fortunately for me at that point, anyway, I learned subsequently what a wonderful officer he was and how much he loved his men and, you know, all that sort of stuff. So in hindsight, it might have been. I was only there for two days and I was kept back with my platoon because they were going to invade uh, we were going to invade the Zambian island uh, from which either Turs or the Zambian army were shooting at the ferry coming from Kariba. And we'd been allocated, our company had been allocated to take out the island. But it fell through for one reason or another. And then one morning at breakfast, Don said, oh, it's, you've got R&R. &R. So, thought, oh, lovely. And uh, a, a crawl plane was going back to Anki. It's the roughest flight I've ever been on in my life. The thermals coming up from the valley. I was hitting my head on the roof. And uh, anyway, got back to Anki. And there I caught um, an Islander aircraft up to Vic Falls. They were going to, there was a dock on board and he was going up there to evacuate some RAR injured. R&R &R with my girlfriend. It was lovely. We were going to the casino to pull the one on bandits and... I would go and watch her serving as a creeper in the other casino, and it was idyllic, going swimming, playing tennis. One night, I decided I'm not going out, I'm tired. So I was lying in our bedroom, 10 o'clock at night, listening to 
spin out, spin out or spin along from Radio 702 in South Africa. Bedroom lights were off, passage light on. I was looking at the window, daydreaming about my events at Kazangula, and all of a sudden there was this bright flash in the window, and I thought, bah, bah. and I thought, was that a weapon or was that thunder? It was sometimes hard to tell the difference. But then a big sheet of green tracer came flying across up in the sky, and I thought, oh dear God. And then another bang, another flash, another flash, another bang. And then you know your adrenaline goes, doesn't it? You, you just get pumped up. And um, I had my uniform, I had a rifle with one magazine, and I thought I'd run around the corner to four in depth, which had been taken over by in shape 155. They'd only just arrived there, and I thought maybe I could offer some local experience to the, the commander there. But anyway, as I was going out the back door, I met um, my next door neighbor, Fricky Blau. Uh, he was much loved by the forces there, uh, or his daughters were much loved. Um, and anyway, he said, I'm going to the cop shop. Uh, and I said, okay, I'll come with you. Now the, the standing orders at Vic Falls were that any guy with the weapon would go to the police station to be given instructions. And so I arrived there and there were about 10 or 15 men in various forms of, of uniform and weapons. And the member in charge said to the sky, Phil, he said, I want you to go along the river to try and stop uh, tours rowing back to Zambia because they'd been hitting elephant hills and the, the attack was still going on, it was heavy. And I, I said, uh, oh, I'll come with you. Anyway, he said, right, he picked up Fricky, uh, selected Fricky and one other guy. And so off we were down to the boat thing. But then when I saw the transport, my jaw just dropped. It, it was um, a grey police Renault R4, you know, a pop-up toaster with the, the, the gear and the dashboard. And I, I said, the road down to the, the boat is right where the twos are firing at Elephant Hills. I said, I'm not going down there. So he said, well, stay. I'll go on my own with the other two guys. Anyway, I went with him. And I thought, I'm an idiot. I'm, I'm on R&R. &R. I've got this beautiful girl coming home in two hours and we were going to make love. And I went out to get myself killed, you know, or potentially killed. And I thought, what's wrong with me? Anyway, went down, got on the boat. We positioned the, the pole that supported the on the left-hand side. So I slotted it into position, put the box of ammo in its tray, put the bullets in, cocked it, ready to go. And so we zoomed off west. And I said to Phil, you know, these guys could possibly row to the island that's by Azambesi and then cross there. I said, go north and east on the other side of the island. So he said, okay. And we did that. And uh, we just got to the end of that island, which is a long one, uh, when we got weed in the jet, a jet powerboat, you know. We got weed in it, and now we were drifting, <laughs> heading for the falls. By the time we had rowed over to an island with our rifle backs, we were now two kilometers uh, north of the falls, because the falls go north-south at that point. I mean, the falls are east-west, but the river comes in from the north. And <coughs> so anyway, Phil had a torch. He, he took off the covering of the engine, <coughs> and he, he had a knife, and he started to cut out this thick rope of weed that had gone in there. Then he did something very brave. He stripped down to his underpants and climbed over the back of the boat and where the jet came out the back, he couldn't find the inlet. But anyway, I wouldn't have gone in that river at night. I really, really admire him. When he'd done the best he could, we pushed the boat back out into the river. Now, at that point, most of the water heads for the boiling pot where Livingston's statue is. And so we were getting drawn into this. And when he fired the motor up, the motor started first go, but when he put it into gear, nothing happened. And now we were getting sucked into the main stream, and it was only two k's away from the falls, and that water was legging it. And I thought, dear God, I'm going to die in the boiling <laughs> pot. Um, anyway, right at the last second, literally, that, that thing cleared. And it accelerated so quickly, the three of us fell over. Phil was in the dry. Anyway, we shot up back between the island and, and Rhodesia, past Azambesi, 
And about 200 meters past that, 300 meters past that, the river narrows quite substantially. And then it was a moonlit night and the water was calm, reflected silver sort of as we were, uh, he was driving very fast. I said, slow down, we can't see anybody leaving some uh, Rhodesia at that speed. And then I saw these, oh, there are lots of uh, fish jumping tonight, but lots of fish jumping tonight, but suddenly the fish had green tracer attached to them. And there we were getting really heavily stung from Zambia. Lots of green tracer flying past us. And so I said to Phil, now because the, the gun was mounted on the left-hand side of the boat, I could only fire into Rhodesia, which was stupid. I said, turn around, I want to have a go at the Zambians. So he turned around and I uh, into Zambia, which was, I don't know if it did anything, but it was very rewarding. And then I said, let's turn right again, go back, we need to finish our task. And we eventually stopped at Hippo Creek, which was a substantial creek. And where we pulled into the creek, uh, there was this very big tree with its uh, branches and leaves hanging in the water, big round thing. And we stopped to the left of the tree. Uh, we had raided the, the police camp because of all the fire. And that got hold of the army. And the army had sent out a ferret and two, two fives to come and pick us up. And we got out of the boat. I handed the browning to another guy. I got my rifle back. And we started to walk inland. Um, and as we were walking south to the road to meet the convoy, there, there was a massive explosion. And so one of the vehicles had hit a landmine. And um, at that precise hitting the Elephant Hills, we were between them and the convoy. And so they opened up and the tracer was sort of coming just a bit above our heads towards the convoy, which was on slightly higher ground. So I turned, we went to ground, and then I got into a kneeling position and I just put my entire magazine into where they were firing from because we could sort of go back from their tracer to estimate where they were. I emptied my whole magazine in there and then I could hear them shouting at us. And I think the other guy used all his ammo shooting Zambia. And so we were out of ammo <laughs> and uh, not a place to be out of ammo. And I could hear them shouting at us and running through the grass. Anyway, we commenced south to the boundary road where this convoy was coming. I, um, now we'd taken the radio out of the boat, but the aerial was fixed to the boat. But fortunately, the, the radio could still transmit about 400 meters. So I got hold of the, uh, and his name is Laurie. He eventually joined the SAS. His surname begins with a W, but I won't give you his whole name. And I made contact with him and I said, four approaching from the east, uh, don't shoot us. So he told all the guys. We eventually linked up with them, shouting friendly forces as we moved in, you know. And there he and another guy were bandaging up the driver of the ferret. He hit his head above him when the thing hit the left front landmine, injured on his head and the bandages were full of blood. The commander had been tossed out of the command turret. Anyway, the two two fires were there. We took him to the one closest to Vic Falls and put him in the right front seat and strapped him in, but the, the strap wasn't working properly. I sat behind him and I put my hand on his shoulder to steady him. And we'd no sooner turned around and bang, we hit a mine. Couldn't believe it. And this one, whack, it was like being hit as hard as a human being could hit your, your ear. And um, out of the corner of my eye, I could see this white bandage traveling through the air and he landed in a bush about 10 feet away. Lost my eardrum instantly, but I still had enough wits to tell the guys to jump off the back and avoid APs and all that sort of stuff. And the guys, Glory and the other guys in the two far behind us, they all debussed and went into all round defense. Uh, with a view to rescuing us if it was an ambush. Uh, in doing so, Laurie had left, left his radio on the truck, which played into what happened next. We'd no sooner got into all-round defense than we started getting more. And because they knew the distance and because they could see 
where the flashes had come from, they were zeroed in on us. And they started firing eighty tubes at us, two mortar tubes. You could hear, even with my bad ear and my good ear, I could hear the primary charges, you know, boom, boom. And then these mortars landed and they were accurate, man. And I tell you, it was so frightening. And so we ran south into the bush to get away. And the bush there is covered in um, buck and vicky thorns. And I ran straight into this buck and even to this day, I've got a scar here where I had to rip myself out of that bush and just carry on running. And we were carrying the wounded guy. And when the guys heard the primary charges, they counted 15 or 20 seconds and then we dived to the ground. And after about 20 or 25 rounds, it stopped. But I'll never forget that night with all the flashes and the smell of cordite and dust and the fear, you know. But we then did a dog leg a semicircular movement back vehicles had come in from, and we had two injured guys. Old, old Fricky was looking, well, he was much older than us, so he wasn't prepared to go much further, I don't think. And so Laurie said, um, I'm going to run back to the calls and call for help. And I said, I'll come with you. And to heck with my asthma that I suffered from as a kid. I was so full of adrenaline that I we sprinted the 4Ks back to the SMBC hotel. And I'll never forget the, the look on the receptionist's face. And we materialized, you know, you know how good our camouflage is. And we materialized out of the darkness with all looking quite beaten up. And, and this poor African receptionist, he just went white. Anyway, the lorry grabbed hold of the phone, he phoned the police, the police got hold of the army. They sent out another two vehicles to go and pick up the guys in the parks. I stayed there, I, you know, I thought to hell with this now, I'm, I'm on, I'm not only injured, but I'm on R&R. &R. Anyway, by that stage, there was quite a lot of blood at the back of my throat and I couldn't hear and I was very dizzy. So an Islander aircraft was dispatched from Wanky to come and pick up the two injured guys. And I got on that plane and you know that. And the next morning I woke up in the hospital and I got to take my hats off to the WVS ladies. Weren't they delightful? They came in and gave me soap and a toothbrush and some magazines to read. And anyway, that was the end of my national service. I was downgraded to C category. And I spent my last two key years as an admin officer. That was Don Price's rear base at Wanky. Now, when I stood down, it was, I'm almost finished my talk, but uh, it was quite funny because all my guys had been calling me sir for 18 months. And now they were saying, oh, where are you going, Tony? Uh, what are you going to do? And they really wound me up, you know. But they were such lovely guys. And um, I was very sad to lose five of them later on but um i didn't know what to do of course to my girlfriend and i said to her i'm not going to find a job here i've got to go back to salisbury which means either you come with me or we break up and she said no i don't want either of that to happen she spoke to the manager at big falls casino at the casino hotel um he looked like a big fat mexican with his moustache fred mccraw i just love that man i tell you because the two years that followed when I lived at the Falls was so exciting with the war going on there. Yeah, I, I got a job there in a casino and one, we worked until about two in the morning because there weren't that many tourists. Then we did what we liked during the day and I'm going to sort of finish off now. Um, we, we decided that we wanted a pet and uh, uh, Arbor Ring, the assistant manager of the casino, said, well, our cats just had a litter why don't you come and pick up a kitten? And so we went on a Saturday morning, never forget that T's house, in, uh, and that house was on the road that actually was at the top of the escarpment. You could see the river, you could see beautiful property, manicured lawns. So we went there for cool drinks and biscuits and we picked up this little fluff ball and time was going by and he said, stay for lunch. That offer had barely come out of his mouth when there was a big explosion below us. And we ran to the lip of his garden, at the end of which was quite a drop into the valley. And there, Elephant Hills had been hit. Okay, um, you can insert a picture of Elephant Hills. 
burning at this point. But um, we couldn't believe that they'd fired a SAM-7 at the tourist plane that Ruak uh, sent over the falls to look at the water. And it had either gone wrong or the heat signature from the thatch on the hotel had attracted the homing section. And there was a, the, the hotel, for want of a better description, was like rectangular in shape. And coming off the side was like a portico where cars would park under there and just, you know, passengers disembark. And it had hit at the junction of the portico and the main patch building. And the, it went up like a spark. It, uh, I mean, it was supposed to have had fire retardant in it. The irony is the day before they tested the, hyd the hydrant system there, but the manager didn't put the key back where he was supposed to, and so they couldn't set up the hydrants to fire, uh, to put the fire out. And it, it went up so quickly, John, I'm telling you, that whole hotel was gone in 40 minutes. And all the tourists were running out and screaming, and it was, you know, of what civilians went through as well as the military. But it was quite a profound event. And I've got a re very rare photograph, which I've given you of it actually being uh, photographed when it was burning down. And the funny thing is the human nature and Rhodesian character. Uh, the next day, the bottom bar was operating, the squash courts, the golf course was open, the shower rooms were working, and there we were all sitting around having beers on the lawns and the swimming pools reopened. And that stayed open right, right amazing. Um, sure. But that's really all I have to share with you. And okay. um, I hope the audience has enjoyed it. Thank you very much, uh, Tony. Um, and uh, I see we do have a second talk planned with uh, with sure. lots lots of other uh, stories and uh, uh, and adventures. Um, but thank you so much. So I, I really enjoyed that. I learned a lot. And uh, thank you. it was interesting. Look forward to our next one. I think the next talk will appeal to people because I described the thwarted invasion by Zipra into Vic Falls, which was a major event and very few people mm. knew about it. And I yeah. will describe how we reinforced the bridge with troops and so on. And then my other stuff when I was in party and attached to Mrs. Gandhi as the liaison officer. Okay. And what happened at Rafara Stadium that night will be very interesting. Okay. Great. Thanks very much, Tony. Thank Look you very to... much, Don. I really appreciate uh, being brought on board. Thank you very much indeed.